got from last Sunday. <laughs> All that studying and working out, and that's it. You know, amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, good morning, church. It is so good to see everyone this Sunday. How are you feeling? We're good? You know, come on, come on. Won't you join us today, right? And you have joined us. It's good to see you. And good morning, Zoom, our Zoom people. So we are about to wrap up chapter two, guys. Wow, let's get right up chapter two. <laughs> chapter two is like a, a five-week sermon series right there in itself. You know, this is good. But it's so good to see everyone uh, and be ready to jump into this today. I want to ask a question, though, before we jump in. What is something that you have been obsessed with within your lifetime? Something that you were like, you were just so obsessed with this thing or this show or this situation or, or whatever. Is there anyone that could say, like, you know what, I used to be so obsessed with this? Ice cream. <laughs> A certain flavor of ice cream, which is all ice cream, just ice cream, period. All of it, all of it. He's like, whatever. <laughs> Frozen milk. That's what I love. <laughs> Anyone else? Something that you were just obsessed with. Go ahead. <laughs> really? I could totally see. Ah, yes. That was like the desired prize, man, in school. Like, it was like, I just want a smelly sticker. Like, that's what we call it, smelly stickers. Yeah, we call it smelly stickers. <laughs> roosters. I, I was terrified of roosters. That's the exact opposite. <laughs> uh, I, got, I got hunted down by a rooster. My grandmother had one. I couldn't stand that thing. But you know, <laughs> Rooster, okay. You know, that's real. That's real life. Board games, oh, word games, word games. Give me an example of a word game that you love. Wordle, oh gosh, okay, okay. That, that is an obsession right there. That is, that is. I had to, I had to detox from that one. I don't <laughs> Baseball history, okay. Baseball cards. Gotcha, okay, all right. Anyone else, any like obsession? Sean, come on. Exactly. I'm like, let the world know. <laughs> My name is Sean. I am addicted to cars. <laughs> you know, we all, so we understand what it means to be obsessed with something, right? When you're obsessed with something, you, it what? What does it do? It consumes, yes, it consumes you. You think about it. You meditate on it day and night. What? <laughs> Prison break. That is addictive. I, know. <laughs> I can relate to that one. What a show. Except for the reboot. That was really bad. But anyway, you know, these are things that we are, we are into. It consumes us, right? I mean, in reality is this. We are obsessed with things. You probably haven't claimed it here. But how many of you guys have been watched something within the past year? Do y'all know what that is, right? It might be a temporary one, but it is an obsession. <laughs> it's a visual. That is a you know, we, it's kind of in our nature to find things to get obsessed with, right? It's like in us to kind of find something and get kind of connected to, plugged into, and it is very difficult to disconnect from, right? You know, we're going to talk a little bit about that this Sunday, about obsessions, right? Things that we should be obsessed with, but I don't think we are always. And I think it reflects something in all of us. You know... The latter part of Acts chapter 2, we, we spent a lot of time last week discussing how the power of the Holy Spirit, when it came upon uh, the people of God, and what was really powerful about that, which we talked about a little bit last week, was the fact that when it came, it spoke to everyone in their own life. I feel like I hear myself. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, like, I was like, what is that? Is that the Spirit speaking to me? What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And so, what was I saying? All right, yes. So, you know, we were talking about how when the Holy Spirit came, one of the unique things that we saw is that the Holy Spirit spoke to everyone in their own language, right? 
And what was the kind of the thing that we highlighted about that was very unique and powerful about that moment? Anyone remember when we talked about that? What did that signify? It signified unity, true. Yes, yes, that the message of God was for everyone. Remember, we talked about how it's interesting how in different religions and different spaces, how it's like, no, you need to learn Arabic. You know what I mean? And, and convert, it's like, man, no, the culture is irrelevant. Really. It's really about God's Holy Spirit, and he communicates with everyone. It's beyond culture. It's beyond language. Regardless of your language, God's like, I am here to meet you where you are and bring you close to me. You don't have to learn a new language, embrace a new culture. You need to seek me and my spirit. And that's going to pull you to where I want you to go. This concept of really embracing the Holy Spirit and being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do things that are greater than yourself is a really unique concept. And where the Holy Spirit tends to bring us is always outside of our comfort zone. Right? It's always outside of our comfort zone. Acts 2.42. Is there a clicker? Can I get the clicker? I could probably skip this sermon. This is a typical ICOC devoted. Are you devoted to this? Are you devoted to that? How devoted are you to the word? How devoted are you to the fellowship? How devoted are you to prayer? I'm not going to go that route. We're going to talk a little bit different about this term devotion. Because I feel like, you know, when you think of the movement of the Holy Spirit, in Acts 2.42, right, it says, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread into prayer. And the movement of the Holy Spirit, it manifested itself in four unique devotions in the lives of the disciples. And, you know, it's funny, one of my uh, favorite authors, I, I read a lot of his work, Dallas Willard, and I'm actually even sharing a few of his quotes here. Uh, he talks about this word devotion. He actually says you could easily translate the word devotion here to obsessed. You know what I mean? Like, that they were obsessed with these four things. You know, and I was like, wow, that's interesting. You know, like, obsessed with these four things. These four things became obsessions for the disciples. Matter of fact, the rest of the New Testament, if you really break down the rest of the New Testament, it will point back to these four devotions. A lot of the teachings of the apostles point back to these four devotions consistently. And so my goal today is to show that if you really embrace the gospel message. Remember the first sermon when we jumped into Acts, I talked about that the disciples were inspired by the message and they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And I said, as we go through Acts, we're going to see this consistently. We're going to see this theme kind of being pulled out on how they were inspired by the gospel message and how they were moved consistently by the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to see that as well. That if you embrace the gospel message, if you are filled with the spirit, these are clearly four devotions that you will embody. Not because you were told to. Not because you were told to. Not because it's on your to-do list. They're natural. It's like breathing. It's a natural thing. Matter of fact, if you are not devoted to these four things, if you see that you are wavering greatly in one of these areas, right? The worst thing you could do is get hyper-focused on it, right? Trying to make this list like, oh, man, you know what? I am not devoted to prayer. So what am I going to do? I'm going to get hyper-focused on prayer, and I'm going to just pray, 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 and that's how I'm going to fix this. Or, you know what? I'm not devoted to the fellowship, so I'm going to be hanging out with disciples. I'm going to show up to everything, and that's how I'm going to fix it. That actually won't help the problem. It won't help the problem. Because these four devotions are fruits. They're not roots. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Like these four devotions, they're, they're fruits. They're not roots. And the problem is, a lot of times we take these four devotions as though they are the roots. And they're not the root. What is the root of our spiritual life? Our relationship with God, the gospel, right? Our relationship with God, that's the root of it. That's, that's, that's what's important. So the question.
question, these things should be like symptoms to let us know something's wrong. Right? When you find yourself wavering in, in these areas, like, oh, man, like, yeah, I'm not devoted to the fellowship, or I'm struggling with that level of devotion to the fellowship, I'm struggling with that level of devotion to prayer or obsession, right? Like, I like that, how, how Dallas Wheeler calls it, obsession with prayer, obsession with uh, the communion. Like, if, I'm not, if I don't find myself really enthralled by that, then there's something wrong with the root, and I got to get back to the root. A lot of times we get focused on the fruit. And what happens when you get focused on the fruit, you become a bitter fruit. And you become, you grow, you grow bitter roots. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to talk a little bit about that as we go into this. So a lack of devotion, a lack of obsession with these four devotions actually expose that you probably haven't embraced have forsaken or forgotten the message or the spirit. And I think sometimes we got to go back and plug ourselves into that. You know, the four devotions, oh, wait, sorry about that. The four things that spirit filled people are devoted to without being told line up in these four areas. If you really think about it, if you are really inspired by the message of Jesus, like you're inspired, you're enamored, like you are in it, man, his word, his message, that, that inspires me. What are you going to want to do naturally? You're going to want to read the word. You're going to want to know his message. You will find yourself obsessed with the teachings of Jesus. You know, and it's funny because... A lot of times, you know, we live in a day and age where devotion to the word of God, devotion to the teachings of Jesus uh, and the first century disciples is not just listening. It's not just hearing. You know, it's doing and practicing. Devotion is not just receiving information. Devotion is practicing it, living it out and doing what it says. We live in a time right now where everyone is listening and learning stuff. Everyone has like a new like, everyone's learning something something different and, and has all this information and insight. Everyone has a new podcast that they are, like, in love with. I'm sure if I ask you guys, what are some good podcasts that we should listen to? I guarantee that half of y'all will throw out ten different podcasts. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this one. And, you know, I'm sure. That's the thing. We're in it. People are in this learning thing. This podcast changed my life. This new book brought so much clarity to me. You know, this new preacher is singing everything and explaining things in such a way that I need to hear it. That's life changing. And right, we all are hearing something, learning different things. And look, that's awesome. That is awesome. You know, and I think it's great. But the thing we got to step back and ask ourselves is devotion is what you do, not what you hear. And the real question is all this information that you're taking in, how is it changing your life? How is it like, how are you really applying it to your life? What does that look like? What are you doing? The gospel message and the Holy Spirit will always guide you to these four devotions, the teachings, the fellowship, the cross, and to prayer. And in all honesty, I believe too many of us are looking for way too much external inspiration a new podcast, a new teacher, the ideal community. But the problem has always been us. It's always been us. A disciple living an obsessed life over these four devotions will be a disciple at peace in the midst of chaos. You see this. But a disciple not living an obsessed life around these four devotions can be in the middle of peace and will create chaos. You know, when the teachings are just words you listen to rather than teachings that change your actions, that change your habits, that change your responses, that change your attitude, then something is wrong. I think we need to read more of the Bible for ourselves. There's something really powerful about that. I think it's great to come and hear a message. Clearly, I'm a preacher. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, kind of goes with the job choice here. That's an awesome thing. 
I think it's great to listen to podcasts. I love podcasts. I love listening to different teachings. You know, I know a lot of us, we even have a group in the Mercer Church with the Bema group, and they meet together, and they, they have their things. You know, side note, I'm not even going to do that. <laughs> Zion said no. Anywho, but it's good stuff. You know what I mean? I like the speaker, you know, and I think it's some great things you can learn from all these teachers. I read tons of books. I love to read. I love to learn more. But I always have to step back and, and figure out, man, with this new insight that I'm learning, how am I making it real in my life? And if it's not really becoming anything new in my actual real life, then what's the power in it? The gospel, what makes the gospel message so powerful is that it, it doesn't just inform you. It transforms you, right? Like that's what makes the gospel message so powerful. And a lot of us have a lot of information that we are like doing <laughs> very little with. Very little with. You know, we always say this, and I think it's super important. We live in a world full of lies, full of hate, full of selfishness and pain. And without the word of God purifying and challenging our hearts, we could fall victim to a lot of this. You know, the word of God is how I survived a lot of the stuff that we dealt with in 2020 and 2021. It really, I mean, at the end of the day, I have to be so honest. It was really sitting down and reading the word because watching TV was not helping. Watching the news wasn't helping. A matter of fact, actually listening to all the, even the spiritual content surrounding the pandemic, surrounding the economic crisis, surrounding the racial tensions, all that stuff, none of that was helping me to find peace with God in that season. I was, I mean, I was digging in. And y'all remember, I mean, we did morning devotionals where I had to be up Monday through Friday, 8 a.m., teaching lessons. And I'm like, this is on, on heavy topics on race and culture and people angry and we did lamenting and mourning, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is so much stuff on these topics. And if I just wasn't reading about Jesus, if I just wasn't sitting down and spending time hearing how the apostles, you know, persevered through difficult moments, I was like, man, all this other cultural stuff, that ain't helping me to have peace. Great speakers, great books, great talks, great messages. I was one of them. I contributed to the noise. You know what I mean? Like, I get it. But man, that word of God stabilized me during that time. It did. The Bible forced me to get out of my house and love my neighbors. When I was like, I need to stay in the house and get away from my neighbors. You know what I mean? People are dangerous. But it was reading the Bible. It was like, no, God calls us. So I had to, okay, well, you got to figure this out, parents. You still got to love people. That, that's a command. Yeah, it's a pandemic. You still have to love. There's no scripture that justifies me hiding myself from the world. I had to figure that out. The Bible gave me peace when I was fearful. The Bible gave me hope when I lost hope. And I did. I struggled. And I shared a lot of this stuff with you guys during that time. I struggled deeply, you know, with, with just how I was seeing stuff. The Bible gave me great hope during that time. And I've said this and I believe this. Look, reading the word of God is a 21st century privilege. It is. We can't forget this. It's a 21st century privilege, right? The disciples that we're so inspired by, that we look up to and we're like, oh my gosh, they're so great. You know, a lot of them couldn't read. <laughs> yeah, I know that, right? Like they, they couldn't read the word of God. They didn't have that level of access to the word, you know? Uh, many of them, they couldn't read. So for them, they heard the word of God, and guess what they did? They memorized it, but it wasn't just memorizing. What did they do? They did it. That was it. They heard, and they lived. Heard, and they lived. They did exactly what James 1 says in James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Listen, a lot of people are deceived right now. A lot of people are deceived. They're, they're hearing podcasts, they're reading books, they, they're full of so much knowledge, but they aren't, they're, their knowledge isn't translating to changing people and affecting their lives. That's a big deal. 
do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in all they do. Many of us have been deceived by our ears. We have allowed ourselves to become content with just tuning in, listening to, and repeating the words of other people. But we are not moving with the word. We're not living it out. And that's what makes all the difference. It really is what makes all the difference. Like, it's not rocket science. Like, it, I, it really is. If you read the Bible and you were like, I am going to do exactly what this is saying right now. That's transformative. I mean, I, I can't even, I'm not even going to try to like come up with analogies and try to expound on this point. Like, I really think it's, it's that simple. But here's the irony. We're not seeing that today. We're not seeing that today. And I think it, it goes back to how connected are we to the message? This isn't about, gosh, you need to go read your word more. I'm not even pointing you to that. I'm just saying, if you see like you're lacking in this area, you might want to ask yourself, how am I doing with my relationship with God for me personally? Me personally, not because the minister is giving some great charge up here, but like, how am I doing? <laughs> you know, like, God, how are we doing? Do I find myself in a space where I'm reading the word or I'm hearing a lot of stuff, but I'm not really putting it into practice? Do I see how the things I've been reading is transforming how I'm living? If you see that, praise God. That's the goal. And if you're listening to speakers and you're hearing teachers and different things like that and you're, you're applying it to your life, praise God. That's the goal. That's the goal. But hearing it, listening to teachers, just so you can say, I heard this podcast or I read this book, and you ain't sharing no life application after? It's just knowledge. And you know what the Bible says about knowledge? But love is an action, and it builds up. You know, another thing is that they were obsessed with the fellowship. Like when you are full of the Spirit, when you're following the Spirit, not just when you're following the spirit, but when you are like, like you are obsessed with the message, like the message of Jesus and the cross, the gospel, when you, when that is like in you, the fellowship is a beautiful thing. The fellowship is such a beautiful space. It's a beautiful place. Matter of fact, it's exciting to be amongst the fellowship. When you are truly moving with the spirit, when you are truly in like deeply enthralled by the word and the message, Man, the, the, the fellowship is awesome. They did, and you know, we, we read this, how they were devoted to the fellowship. And, you know, we had 3,000 people that were baptized in one day. I don't think all 3,000 were meeting together, right? That would, I mean, if you look at their actual living quarters, that would be really impossible. Right? Like they, they didn't even have a lot of living quarters like this. I mean, matter of fact, if you look at a lot of the first century uh, disciples and just people who lived in Jerusalem at that time, I mean, we live in mansions, you know, temples of our own in comparison, right? So they did this by meeting in small groups, you know, meeting in their homes day by day. And the funny thing is that's us with our small groups, just meeting together in our small groups. That's the power of everything. It's like, man, they were excited to meet together, to be with one another. You know, church is like a prep rally. It's an exciting little prep rally we do. Sorry about that. <laughs> you know, church is like a prep rally. We're excited. We're, we're all engaged. You know, that's what Sunday is supposed to be. Now, everybody, let's go. Right? Start the week off. That's what Sunday is. That's that in of itself. This is another privilege that we have. You know, another 21st century privilege to gather together like this and do this. Right? Prep rally. Go. Right? And the thing is, what happens most of the times when we go, we go to work. <laughs> right? We go to school, which is great. You got to take the message. You know what I mean? Take the gospel. 
But the funny thing is, we don't go and hang with each other. Like, we, we don't do that. That's, that's kind of a funny thing. Like, we don't go. Let me make time with my brothers and sisters and get to know and embrace, you know, our small groups. Again, I love this. In Acts 2, to me, it is one of the most impactful things. Again, like I shared, y'all remember, I come from a Pentecostal background. Acts 2 had a completely different meaning for me, right? For many years, many years, a different meaning. But to come and see that, man, the Holy Spirit coming and, and them speaking in different languages was really an embrace that the gospel message is for everyone, not just a certain type of people, but everyone. And God's coming to meet them where they are. That was impactful to me because then it inspired me to step out of my cultural comfort zones and get to meet other brothers and sisters that are different than me, that probably don't have the same background, racial or ethnic background as me, but embracing the community of faith that I am a part of, the diverse community of faith that I'm a part of. And so, yeah, you remember, I remember actually going to spend time at, you know, this, this, is, this is me, all right, don't judge me, okay? But I remember going and hanging out with the first white couple in the church that they were like, hey, come on for dinner. And I was like, okay, this is interesting. You know, and I'm just spending, I'm, I'm hanging out with them, and I'm just, you know, and they were, they were Irish, you know, this is an Irish family, and I was like, man, this is, this is real different. Like, and they just moved here about a year ago, so they, they're fully enthralled in their culture, their background, you know, and to this day, <laughs> what's the meal that we, we literally just had it, I don't cook it, corned beef, yeah, you know, that was my first introduction to corned beef, I was like, this is, where did you guys get this manna, like, you know what I mean? Like, I was, I was so, like, in love with this. And this is a small group Bible talk. We were all together, and we are meeting. This is our Bible talk leading group. And I was like, man, this is so cool. I loved it. Like, and, and I was introduced to something brand new. And not just to a food, but I was introduced to family now. And it opened my eyes to there's more to this world than even my culture, my inner city background that I'm part of. That was transformative. And I started spending time and, and again, just engaging. I remember my first year as being a disciple, man. I was, the fellowship was everything. Hanging out with people, spending time. And it wasn't like it was a command. I just, I really wanted to spend time with disciples. Like, I wanted that. I wanted to find other like-minded believers who were trying to live out Christianity. I needed that, that inspiration, that support. Like, I, I, I searched it out intensely now my life was a little different then i was single i was a campus student fast forward 17 years later a wife and two kids and a career that flexibility ain't the same as it used to be right <laughs> that ability just gotta pop up at someone's house you know what i mean at 10 o'clock wasn't the same Matter of fact, people pop up in my house at 10 o'clock. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you don't... <laughs> and that's like, I don't do that. I know pop up if you want, if you dare. You know, but like, <laughs> like, it's a different space, right? But here's the thing. It's so funny. Are we still obsessed with the fellowship now? Or did we let our circumstances and situation drown that out? Become a convenient excuse. Again, now, let's understand this. I think you need to acknowledge for yourself, if that obsession has wavered, don't go trying to hang out with a bunch of people. Pull, pull back, because I know how we are. As, as a church, I know how we are. That's why I keep doing this. Stop. Don't, don't, don't go, okay, I got to go hang out with disciples. No. Pull back. Spend time with God. Pray. Read the word. Allow the word of God to motivate you. Allow your relationship with God to reinvigorate you. If you see that there's wavering in this space. Man, and if, it, if there is wavering, before I even said this stuff, the Holy Spirit was already talking to you. Like real talk. Like the Holy Spirit was already letting you know. You know, we need to, you should reach out. You should go hang out. You should go, like you should initiate. The Holy Spirit is already doing this. So don't let this, don't let me be the catalyst. Make it about God. Make it about your relationship with God. It has to start there. 
you know, we have these small groups that we have as a church, and I love how the word together is like throughout the scripture. You notice that when you read through this, this little section, it says that together, they ate together, they broke bread together, they prayed together, they visited together, they served together. So the question is not, are you, and I think for all of us, I think, you know, we got to kind of pull ourselves back. Even with what we do as a church, how we kind of intentionally created these small groups. There's a purpose behind it. And it's not just random small groups. It's like small groups within your local area. There's a purpose behind that as well. The question I think we all should ask ourselves is, are we investing in people's lives? And are you opening your life so that others can invest into yours? You know, it's not just that are we together in a big group, you know, for church, tuning in on Zoom for a service, you know. And I, and I, and I will say this, you know, and I, I definitely want to put this out here. Embracing the fellowship is a natural response to the gospel. Embracing and being obsessed with the fellowship is a natural response to the Holy Spirit. Some of the excuses, I think we got to make sure that we're, we don't allow that to supersede the gospel or the Holy Spirit are things that I've heard recently that I think it's important to address. You know, where you could say something like, well, I was in a small group, but I wasn't getting much out of it. And I think statements like that, I, I want to challenge you. Place that statement next to the Bible. And, and how does that stack up? Because I think a lot of times we're always asking what we're getting out of something. And is that really the right gospel response? What, what's more of the gospel response to a lot of that? It's what are you putting into it? It's what you're putting into it. And this is like the great irony of like the gospel that I don't think we fully always embrace. I think we're, we're very much trained by American consumer culture. That's all about what do you get out of something? Man, if you ain't getting nothing out of it, then it clearly is not for you. If you're not getting what you want out of this, it's clearly not for you. Now, again, there's always levels to this. And I don't want to speak in absolutes. I'm not saying that you should ever put yourself in a position or be comfortable in a position where you're abused or you're disrespected or being mistreated or you're being harmed. Let's just have some balance here while I'm sharing these type of things. I feel like I always got to give that parity. But I do think as a, as a Holy Spirit-filled individual, as a gospel-inspired individual, to have the mindset of what am I getting out of this and not what can I give to this, how can I add to this, I think it's the wrong question. And it's a dangerous space to start putting yourself in. You know, if the goal, if that's the goal, the goal is always to give ourselves away. That's the gospel message, to give yourself away. How can you consistently give yourself away? How can you pour yourself out? You know, because the great irony, like I said, is you get so much back when you give up with God. There's so much you get back when you give up. So much. You know, it's like my family. You know, we went on a family vacation. Obviously, we had some time spring break with the kids. And I, I always make it very clear. There's a difference between vacation and a family trip. I used to mix the words together. I used to say it's a vacation when we're going with the family. And then I come home extremely disappointed because <laughs> right? I have not rested at all. I'm actually more exhausted when I get home than I was before I left. And I'm like, what kind of vacation is this? It's not a vacation, you know? And so I'm end up struggling. But I had to change it. It's a family trip just from my own mindset, all right? And those parents, if you know, you know what I'm talking about. I had to change my mindset towards it. And actually, when I changed my mindset, it helped me to remember, I'm going to create memories with my family. So you know what? I'm going to pour myself out on this trip. Oh, I'm pouring myself out. If I don't come home exhausted, then I probably didn't serve my family during this time. And that's legit my goal. Like when I go on a family trip or we do something together, I'm like, I am going to pour myself out. Now, my wife might have to deal with some complaining when we get back. <laughs> I'm just but 
I mean, the, the reality is, I go, we go, and I'm like, I am, I am all over the place. You know, let's go here, let's do this. I'm dragging the kids, I'm carrying, I am pouring myself out for them, because that's why I came. We came here to do that. We came here to build memories. We came here to build something. We came here to love each other. So I can't sit back and be like, no, well, the kids, y'all need to serve me. We're on vacation. I came here to get served. Y'all need to just do what I say, the way I say it. It should be easy. It should, it should, be, it should be convenient. It should be comfortable. No. I, I want to bust the bubble here with church. Church? We come here to give. Sunday should be a time you're pouring yourself out to your brothers and sisters. And I, I say this all the time, man. When you pour yourself out, when you're motivated by the gospel, when you're inspired by the Holy Spirit, and you're pouring yourself out to your brothers and sisters, you will be poured back into. Best believe it. It is a promise from God. That's not that's going to happen. God's not going to let his children just walk around empty-handed. You're a vessel for him to pour into so you can pour out. But if we're just coming in, I'm just, I'm just here to get filled. It already starts off bad. Like, it really does. It starts off bad. Matter of fact, you probably won't get filled with what you want because you're expecting something, and you're not open to anything. You don't know what the Holy Spirit wants to give you. So it's a level of humility on how we're going to get the most from the fellowship. The way you get the most from the fellowship is by giving to the fellowship. That's it. You could just stamp that. You will get what you give in this space. I guarantee it. I really was so inspired by the message yesterday, uh, the communion message that Kenny did, even though he didn't listen to anything I shared. I gave very specific instructions to communion. I've learned that most people don't listen to those instructions when they do it. Thank you, Zoe. You did a great job. <laughs> no, but my point, yeah, Rodrigo laughed, because you too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but you know it's it's funny but again the messages that came up here i mean to hear that life story even with rod regal to hear that hear hear them teach about the the cross and remind us on what it not it was not and what it should be i mean these things are powerful i walked away feeling so much more connected to my brother kenny after hearing his story you know, like these, this is what the fellowship does. And when you are inspired by the Holy Spirit, when you are inspired by the gospel, man, you're going to get so much out of this space. Even if it was just three of us, you'd get so much out of it. You'd get so much out of it. We have to go from being consumers back to being disciples. And I truly believe the pandemic has, has really transformed that space that we are a bit more consumers than we are disciples. You know, I was talking to someone. Y'all gonna have to follow me on this one. Don't get too sensitive. And if it's so, it's, it is what it is. You know, I was talking with someone. He's like, man, yeah, I, I love, you know, I'm, he was sharing with me, he reached out to me online. I was like, I love being a part of MRSA. You know, this has been great. The sermons are powerful. I really like this stuff. It's been great. And I'm like, Part of Mercer, I haven't seen you. And he was like, yeah, but no, I'm a part. I'm just, I just, you know, I tune in, I watch it when you guys post it online. And I'm like, well, okay, that's, that's awesome. You know, that's awesome. It's great. But I was like, listen, you're not a member. And he was like, but I tune in. To all. I'm like, you, that's not what it means to be a part of a church. Like, that's not, and I'm like, I'm sorry. And I know that we're in a space now where, that's the mindset that a lot of people want to believe to be a part of a church. It's about you tuning in. But I was like, that's not what it means to be a part of a church. I'm sorry. You, the church is the fellowship. It is us being connected and, and meeting people, pouring out and being poured into. That, that's the church. Like, I, I, can't, I can't ice skate that. And he's like, well, I, be, I take notes. And I mean, it, we ended up having a little debate about it. But I was like, dude, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, and I'm grateful that my messages are inspiring. That's encouraging. 
Well, if you're going to lean your, your walk with God on my messages, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I ain't that cocky. You know what I mean? <laughs> we all got limits here, all right? You know? And I understand mine. Listen, the gospel is not about listening to a message. The gospel, and this is even for my Zoom brothers and sisters, real talk. If you're not connecting with people on a weekly basis, if you're not engaging with disciples, that's a problem. It's important to figure out how can you connect with the people. That's church. That's church. It's always going to be this. And this will be a message that I will not shy back from. We have to make sure that we are connecting with one another and we're engaging one another. We cannot turn the church, we can't turn discipleship into consumerism. The church is not a product. The church is a relationship with people. When you think about this, the only thing consumerism has produced in this world is broke, lazy, selfish, entitled people. That's the only thing consumerism has produced. Broke, lazy, selfish, entitled people. And when I see people living out their Christianity from that standpoint, that's what I hear. A lot of complaining, a lot of entitlement, and not a lot of pouring out. Not a lot of giving. That is not discipleship. It's never produced that. True discipleship does not produce that. It actually produces the exact opposite. Consistently. You know... So I'm going to get off that for now. We're going to talk more about that as we go. So I'm going to go right to the next point. <laughs> the other thing was being obsessed with communion, the breaking of bread. Man, when you are inspired by the Holy Spirit, when you're inspired by the message of the cross, communion is a whole different space. You know, this devotion is not based on, you know, when I, when I read this, the, the breaking of bread, I was like, oh, this is... So we're going to eat when we come together at church? That's a church. <laughs> you know, like, I remember first hearing this. Where's the food? You know, like, but it's about communion. Here's the thing that's really unique about communion. I just want to share this, this little, little point here. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of who? Me. You know, do this in remembrance of me. It's also, you know, we're called to remember not just him, but his, the covenant that he made with us. This covenant that he made with you. He said, I made a covenant with you. Remember, because of me, you are eternally forgiven. Remember that because of me, you can commune with God. Remember that because of me, you are not defined by your worst moments. Why is this so important? I'm, I'm asking. I really want to hear from you guys. Why is this so important to remember those things? Mm. <laughs> mm hmm. Hey, Amen. Yeah. Anyone else? Mm. And that why changes everything. It's like I, I keep sharing. If this, if the cross is not your inspiration, all this other stuff is like, it is, it's not going to work. It will create bitter roots in you. It will. Like if you're doing just the, the goal is I got to check this list off, it will create bitter roots I've watched this happen to many disciples over and over again. It's like a really, like, it's a horror movie for me. You know, where I, I hear disciples share about their experiences. And every time I hear it, I'm like, it's because you were motivated by the wrong thing. Your why was not the cross. Your why was this brother, this sister, this circumstance, this situation, this desire, this goal, this outcome. It wasn't the cross. When we, like, 
Brian shared, when we forget Jesus, when we forget the message, when we forget the Holy Spirit, we don't have to pour, we don't have to drive to pour ourselves out anymore. We're empty. We're empty. We don't have the drive to to give ourselves give of ourselves to anyone. We don't have the drive to or the desire to sacrifice our time and convenience. We don't have the heart to persevere with difficult people or difficult situations. Like you don't have it. You ever just felt like you're done? Like you're just I don't have it to give. Like even with at home, family, work, kids, you know, you get those times when you're like, you know, school, I'm done. I'm sorry. I'm done. No more work. I'm not going to work today. I'm not, I'm not talking to y'all. Get out my face. You know that when you're done? Yeah, we know that. <laughs> you know, we get to points where we are done. What gets you back in the game? <laughs> Rent. <laughs> Mortgage. <laughs> that gets me back in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only here to pay my bills. <laughs> uh, you know, what gets us a lot of time, what gets us back is remembering the why. Right? You got to remember your why. You got to remember your why. And I, I would be a horrible minister if I didn't push the fact that your why is the cross. It is not me. It is not the church. I don't even care about any of this stuff. It is the cross. If you are inspired by the cross, everything changes. What we're trying to build here is transformative. If each and every disciple is inspired by the cross, if they lived like they're, I'm engaging with you because of Jesus and what he's done for me, and I want to know more about you, what has he done for you, like I'm in that, it's, it's different. It's so different. And I think we all know this, and the sad thing is, I always feel like I got to echo you back to your, your genesis with Christ. Because there's something about that moment when we first heard the message and what that produced in us, right? Like what that produced in all of us. When we first heard the gospel message and the cross and what Jesus did for us, it's transformative. And it led to such natural obsessions that are beautiful, natural devotions that are beautiful. As time went, we forgot them. But it's not that we forgot the devotions, it's that we forgot the message. That's why I love that we take communion every Sunday. Because it, it, it's, it's supposed to remind me through the lives of my brothers and sisters how powerful that cross still is. That's the power of communion. You know, Johnny, uh, not Johnny, Tommy did a, a, a message on prayer for us a few weeks back. You guys remember that? And Tommy made a great point. Went back and listened to it. And he talked about how we don't pray very often even in our services, right? I thought that was a great point in how we highlight that. Like, what is prayer for us? You know, our prayer life is a reflection of our dependency on God. It really is. Your prayer life is a reflection of your dependency on God. I actually believe your prayer life is probably the greatest barometer to how you're doing spiritually. For you, not for me, not me looking at and doing a checklist, but I think for you, you actually, and here's why I would go that far to say such a big statement. Because when everything hits the fan, right? When things get out of your control and you and it is dark and it is bad and it is like you 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 went every direction and you have nowhere else to go, what do you do? What does everyone do? I mean, they don't even have to believe in a God. What do they do? They pray. Why do they pray? Because they have nothing else to hold on to. When you have nothing else, when you know you have nothing else to hold on to, you pray. Sad thing is, sometimes that's what it takes for us to be reminded of that before we pray. Like before we really get down and like have some like on our knees, ashy knees for people like me. <laughs> ashy knee prayers. You know what I mean? Before you get some of them prayers, it's like you got to 
you got to be reminded. It's, it's crazy because we forget that we're supposed to be completely dependent on God. An obsessed, a devoted prayer life is a reflection of someone who is dependent on God, understands their true dependency. It's a, it's a depth of acknowledgement of how you have a sustained relationship. I need you. Every hour I need you. I'm lost without you. I don't have anything. But man, it's like when we really pray, it's because it's like I'm trying to get this job, trying to get this situation blessed, trying to get this relationship, or trying to get the relationship fixed. You know what I mean? Like, I've, I've done everything. I have nothing else. Now I'm praying. Again, Real prayer, deep prayer, that begging to God prayer, that desiring to see you prayer, it only comes after we've exhausted many options, not common. And again, when you are inspired by the message, when you are moved by the Holy Spirit, prayer is so natural. It's so natural. You know it. You, you, you desire it. You actually plan special times for it. You make it, you put it in your schedule, like I'm looking forward to some prayer and meditation time. Like, I, I, I prepare for it. I'm thinking about it. I have a space set up for it. You know what I mean? Like, it's special. When, when, you, when it's an obsession, when you're devoted to that. It, it is. You know, I hate to make sermons kind of go into like an all practical do, 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 do list. I, I really have kind of, I feel like 2020 is kind of really raying a lot of that out of me. Um, but I can't act like devotion doesn't look like something. Like, we, we can't do that, right? Like, we got to be fair. Devotion, devotion looks like something. And that's just reality, right? A devoted prayer life looks like something. And you got to ask yourself, what does it look like for you? For real. And I say, go to your darkest moment. Go to that, that moment when you, when you were desperate. That's what an obsessed, devoted prayer life looks like, <laughs> right? Question is, how can you re how can you make that your norm, where you you lean on prayer like that? You know. So, in conclusion, is this verse forty-two, verse forty, uh, chapter two, verse forty-seven? It says, "Praising God." And enjoying the favor of all the people, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. When you have people who are devoted to these things, a devoted lifestyle, devoted to the word, devoted to uh, the fellowship, devoted to uh, breaking of bread, devoted to prayer. Do you know what the result of that is? The result of it is others becoming obsessed with God. When you are living that lifestyle out, when you are obsessed with prayer, you're obsessed with uh, the communion, you're obsessed with the fellowship, when you're, that's, when you're living that out, the result of it is others will become obsessed with God. And you see it in verse 42. It says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The result was evangelism. The result was more people like, man, what are you doing? What 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 has changed your life? And you know the thing they didn't point them to. They didn't point them to their devotions. They pointed them to Jesus. See, a lot of times, and that's the world we live in now. We like to point people to these practical devotions, right? Oh, you know what's changed me? It's my church. It's it's come to the church again. I'm not. I know this could sound a little crazy, right? I'm not trying to shoot down church. But I'm like, the church is great, but the church is the product of Christ. So we point, you point them to Jesus. You know what? No, it's just my prayer life, my prayer. Well, no, it's not your prayers. It's who you're praying to. So you point them to Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, oh, what's changed me is it's the word. It's not necessarily the word. It's who the word's talking about. It's Jesus. Right? Getting people back to Jesus is transformative. 
you know, Dallas Willard, I, I said I was going to share a quote from him that I really like. He says this. Um, All of these things sustain the message. When you have a group of people devoted so much to the message that they'll suffer for it, no longer live only for themselves, but give themselves to each other, are so joyful in Jesus that they don't need money, when they when they believe so strongly in God that their services are characterized by prayer and the sense of God's presence, people will believe. Jesus is contagious. People just need to see him. You know, this concept of many people being added is very powerful. Because the result of it is not, and I, and I think it's a, it's a different way of looking at evangelism. Because I think even evangelism is a checklist thing that we kind of put on a checklist. If you go out and share your faith more, da 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 If you're inspired by Jesus more, if you're inspired by the Holy Spirit more, these things are automatic. I want to put this out here to a lot of us. Truth is, we're all devoted, we're all obsessed with something. The problem is, it's just not the same thing. We're all obsessed, we're all devoted to something. It's just not the same thing. You know, obsession is a very natural thing for all of us. We all talk about it. You know what I mean? Like, we all have an obsession, even if you didn't share it. What, we, what I want you guys to catch is this vision. What would it look like? Or how amazing would it be if everyone in the church was fully obsessed with Jesus like this? What would that church look like? A church full of people obsessed, devoted to Jesus. What does that look like for us? You know, I want to leave you guys with that thought and transition to a thing that I definitely want to make sure that we're, we're mindful of. You know, uh, one of the things that I don't think my wife shared it during the announcements that we're going to be changing up our midweek, our midweek schedule moving forward in April. So the first week will be a men's midweek. The second week will be a women's midweek. And the third week will be mission week. And Mission Week is where our small community groups will be meeting together. And they'll be having a, whether a discussion or some type of event to kind of be a light in their community, whether it's a Bible talk or different things like that, some way to engage their community and what that looks like. And I just want to share this with you guys. Like, this is a great opportunity to live these things out. It's a great opportunity, you know, and I know we're in a space where it's hard to, I just feel like a lot of us are in different spaces. But I want to make sure that you understand that that door is open for you. To practice these things, it's a piece of cake. It's not hard. A lot of opportunities to practice. The real question is, are you inspired by the right thing? I pray that you spend time reading the word of God, allowing his message and his spirit to inspire you to live out these devotions. When you're connected to that message, when you're connected to the Holy Spirit, yeah, this, this shouldn't be a, a hard talk. This should be a celebration, right? Talking about Acts 2, 42 to 47 should be like, this is awesome. This is, this is, this is what we do. This is what we love doing, you know? Let's get inspired by the right stuff. And we will start... Chapter 3, next week.